Okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna need your help with a word today because, you know, we've been in this. At, I'm I'm just guessing it's about six weeks we've been in Jonah, you know, and you can take Jonah and you can actually teach Jonah in one setting, you know. And here we've we've been at it for like six weeks. And I'm scratching my head, going, why why been where why are we in Jonah for six weeks? Because God is just trying to bang on our hearts and our minds to get some things. And so um, I'm going to pray. We're going to read through the last chapter. And then I hope that some of you will have confidence in the next, for the next five minutes or so to share some things that you've taken away from Jonah thus far. And then I want to, uh, and then if those things you don't share, I'm going to fill in kind of the, the gaps. Because I really, I really believe that Jonah was a real important, is a real important message for us today, as well as the church worldwide. So, Father, we uh, <clears throat> come bowing to your authority, bowing to your majesty, and your wonder, and your beauty. We're so grateful that you would call us friends, even though we haven't been such a great friend to you. But you have shown yourself faithful time and time and time and time again. And even with Jonah, you have shown yourself gracious and merciful time after time after time. And yet his behavior wasn't appreciative, didn't seem to be appreciating of your grace and your mercy and your love. And so we pray that the end result of this thing, uh, the end result of our time together today, that we would not be as Jonah has been. But I pray that you'd also show us how we have also behaved just like Jonah. So we bow to your authority. We ask that your Holy Spirit would move, guide, and direct us in our time today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I'm going to start at the end of chapter 3 at the repentance of the Assyrians, at the repentance of the Ninevites. God's verse 10 of chapter 3 says, Then God saw their actions that they had turned from, all the, from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened to do to them, and he did not do it. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's heart. That's God's heart, and that's, that's the heart that... that caused Jonah to run because he didn't he wanted <laughs> he wanted to see God's wrath being poured out upon the Assyrians and the Ninevites and yes they deserved it yes we deserve it but that's not God's heart to do that he would so much rather love us and lead us into this relationship with him and have mercy and grace but Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious he prayed to the Lord, please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are merciful, are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to become angry, rich in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. I, I pause there for a minute because I, I, I've heard myself say that, just kill me now. <laughs> you know, I don't know if anyone said it, but just kill me now, Lord. You know, if I can't do this thing right, just kill me now. You know, just that's really stupid and ridiculous. But anyway, then the Lord asked, is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry? Oh, man. Boy, I wish we would ask ourselves that question. Is it right for us to be angry when we're angry at times? Jonah left the city and sat down east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God, listen to this, then the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up to provide shade over Jonah's head to ease his comfort. Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. I mean, look at the power and majesty of God that he just, okay, Jonah's laying there and okay, well, here's a plant. Boom, Pew, grow and provide shade for him. Man, that's something, something else, the power and sovereignty and majesty of God. And so when dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm. God's appointing things, man. Appointed a worm that attacked the plant and it withered. Okay, worm, go do your thing. I mean, 
God is just subtly popping off his power. Go, worm. And the gorge just withers up. As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. Now, God is having power over the elements now, y'all. East wind, pew, throw some heat down on him. I mean, if we slow down to think about some of these things, God is something else. The sun beat down so much on Jonah's head that he almost fainted and he wanted to die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, he replied, it's right. I'm angry enough to die. So the Lord said, you cared about the plant which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. Should I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals? Lord God. And then he leaves us hanging. And we can sit there and just go, wow, what's up with that, Jonah? And just leave it for Jonah to consider. But the reality is this, that question is for you and I. Sometimes we have a hard time dealing with people, people in our families, people outside of our sphere of influence and other man-made, what we can, I call man-made races. We all belong to the family of God and man came in and divided everything up. And so that's some of the reason why we have the problems and difficulties this day, because we're following man's rule and man's law versus God's law. But my Bible tells me we came from all, came from the same family. And we can't get it right. So we're having family issues. So he rebukes in his question, he rebukes Jonah. And in the reality, he's rebuking us too. So whoever we're having difficulty in loving today, uh, that question is for you. That question is for me. I have to deal with it. We have to wrestle with it. This is God's word. And we can sit there and go, oh, that was message was for somebody else. No, don't do that. If we're taking the time to meet before the Lord and, and, and we're reading God's word, this is dad speaking to us through his letter. And we got to get it. We get, are, are you on... God's page on or are we on our own page or or are we on someone else's page God wants us on his page because he knows what's best for us all yeah at the at the uh, little league game we were kind of half joking in the in the stands and you know it's just like God I think I know what is what's right and you know can't you be wrong and then um, Eunice says God's perfect will we have to go with God's perfect will because his will is perfect if we would just trust him and see, see it all the way through. But we don't have the ability to see it all the way through, so we want to trust in what we think we have control over. And, uh, but we need to learn how to trust him implicitly, and we'll see the perfect will unfold before us. And then at the end of it, we will just go, wow, I never knew you really wanted to bless us that way. But we had to go through the deep, dark, fiery cloud in order to get there. And it's, sometimes it's too, it's hot and it's fearful to go through the deep, dark, fiery cloud. But he's behind that cloud. And the only way that you can get to it is by going through it to meet him. So there's a couple of things that I want us to hit here. And the first one is knowing God. Knowing God. Which is better, knowing about God or knowing God personally and intimately? Many of us know about him, just like Jonah did. Now I'm going to read a um, New Living Translation version of verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4. New Living says this, Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this? 
That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. I knew how easily you could cancel your, <clears throat> excuse me, cancel your plans for destroying these people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive because nothing I predicted is going to happen. Did you catch the subtlety in that? Nothing I predicted is going to happen. Jonah's more concerned about <clears throat> his reputation as a prophet than God's will being done. And for me, I'm like, wow, God, for me, as a pastor, have I been in that position? What about the rest of the pastors throughout the world today? Are they more concerned about their reputation and how they're going to look? Because thus saith the Lord, and then you relent to do disaster because the people repented. And then, now how does that make me look? Well, and the thought is, well, shoot, he's some pastor because he said that God was going to destroy and God didn't destroy, so he ain't nothing. God forgive our pride. That person talks so bad about me, I hope they burn in hell. And you just wait to see them. You know, I wish they would just go. I don't want any blessings to come upon those people. And they repent. And God starts to bless them. And we get all soury face because we're hurt. And we're not exercising the forgiveness that God has actually should have implanted in part of our heart that we should be forgiving people because he's forgiven us so much. So knowing God, he knew about God, but if he really knew him really intimately, he would be on God's page. And you know, in Amos it says, two can't walk together unless they be in agreement. So he's walking away from God. He's not in agreement with God. And if we really know God intimately, and we know his power, his might, his majesty, and we honor and respect him and have that rever certain reverential fear of him, we're going to be in step with him and walk right with him. And know that if there's something wrong in a situation, chances are the wrongness is in me, not in him. And so, oh, I don't understand this, so I'm going to keep, keep, still keep a step with you. Knowing God personally, walking in God's grace and mercy. Jonah, he is personally experiencing the grace and mercy of God, but his heart is too hard with anger and hatred to realize it. His, his thinking is totally clouded. He is getting firsthand experiential, experiential knowledge of God's grace and mercy. He, he should have realized that, that he's in the belly of a great fish, that he should be digested up and just the acids of it just should have just consumed him. But God preserved him just as much as God preserves you and I in our difficulties and in our woes and in our trials and even in our sin because he died on the cross for our sin. We should be consumed the moment the bad thought comes, but we're not consumed because the punishment that we deserve was put upon Christ. Now at the end of all things, if we reject that mercy and grace, then yes, his consuming power, will we will experience the wrath of God because we have chosen not to be inoculated, so to speak, not to be vaccined, not to take the antidote from death, you know, to, to, to have life. And, you know, it's just like we've been bitten by the serpent, we've been bitten by Satan, and the only antidote here is Christ. <clears throat> but some of us, are, you know, the world is refusing the antidote to the venom of the serpent. So my question, I guess, for you and I is, is, is this you right now? Is this me right now? So God's grace and mercy is available to us. Have we actually received it? 
because if you know that he died for you and you know how deserving you are of just being thrown under the bus, but yet you're not thrown under the bus, but yet he's exalted you, your heart is going to reflect that. You're going to be gracious. You're going to be kind. You're going to be loving. But we don't see that in Jonah. And it's a question that you and I really have to deal with because if we don't, we really run a risk that's hard to recover from. I'm going to turn to Galatians chapter 5, and I want you to see this, and then we're going to go to James chapter 3. this way. It talks about being in the flesh or being in the spirit, walking in the spirit or walking in the flesh. And then we're going to deal with walking in the flesh first. The works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery. Now, probably Jonah would say if he was sitting here, ah, I don't have any problems with any of that. I think he might say that. Maybe he will maybe you won't but I think this list that continues here he, he, he starts scratching his head and starts sweating a little bit hatreds we know that he hated strife we know that he's filled with strife he's going to be a little jealous of course as they repent because just now the the Jews of, of course he thought was the, the chosen race which they the chosen people even though this the God has chosen them to reveal himself to the whole entire world, that salvation would come to the whole entire world through them. Jealousy of the uh, Gentiles coming to a saving knowledge and saving faith of Christ. Outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions and factions, envy, Boy, that describes Jonah. Whether the rest describes him or not, drunkenness and carousing, we don't see that in the scriptures at all. But probably somewhere in this list, there may have been something that twinged your heart and my heart. I know for a fact in my heart. Yeah, Phew. bing, bing, bing. <laughs> and But thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for that sin. I don't use that as, a, as an excuse and as a license to continue on in that sin, but I'm just grateful that you died on the cross for that sin. And Lord, continue to take, take it from me, continue to move me, continue to cause me to grow, continue to cause us to grow. It's like Paul, you know, he had his thorn in his flesh. He's just like, Lord, would you just take this? He pleading with me. And then God says, Paul, my grace is sufficient. And now there's this thankfulness that we have towards God now. This appreciation that we have for what the Lord has done. And it tempers us. It softens us. And it helps us to be the people that we ought to be with each other. These angers, hatreds, jealousies, if they continue to stay in our flesh, I want you to see what James says will happen in our hearts in James chapter 3 if we just let it sit there and fester you know another place in scripture it says out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks so whatever is just filling up in your heart you're, it's, it's going to be it's going to come forth out of your mouth so if there's a lot of hatred in your mouth or in your heart it's going to it's going to show. You're not going to be able to hold it for too long. You might be able to hold it for a minute, but eventually it's just going to go, Bleh! you're going to vomit this stuff up. If you have anger in your heart, Bleh! if you're filled with depression and anxiety, that's going to show up. You just freak out. It's just going to show up. 
And so as I was, as I was praying about this, I, I when it came across James chapter 3, and it talks about the tongue and our, and our inability, seemingly inability to control the tongue. It says this, first of all, it says, Not many should become teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature man, a mature woman, a mature human being who is able, who is also able to control his whole body. So if you're able to control this tongue, then you, you, you're pretty good at self-control. Now, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we also guide the whole animal and consider ships Though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, the tongue is a small part of the body. It boasts great things. Consider how large a forest a small fire ignites. I mean, that's just amazing. One little spark can set off a forest fire that can last for weeks and months. That's, that's amazing when you think about that. So, that's how powerful our tongue is by just saying something that we ought not to say and it sparks something and we can ruin people's lives with just our very tongue. Oh, you know what? He's this. Oh yeah, he's that. And then that goes, and then that goes. The next thing you know, they got the whole neighborhood thinking, oh, this guy's this. And he may not even be anywhere close to the, that description. And we've ruined their lives and now they can't get work. Now they can't get any friends. They can't even get people to pray for them now because they, they, everybody views them in this particular way. The tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among the parts of our bodies. It pollutes the whole body. It sets the course of life on fire, and it is set on fire by hell. Every sea creature reptile, bird, or animal is tamed and has been tamed by man. I think of Shamu. Shamu has been tamed by man. That great big old fish is tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a relentless evil, full of deadly poison. And again, it comes from the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We praise our Lord and Father with it, and we curse men who are made in God's likeness with it. Praising and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers, these things should not be this way. This is the Lord's brother speaking this. He's learned this from his brother. Of course, of course he didn't believe that Jesus was the, the Messiah at first, but then after he died and rose again, he just, oh, wow, Jesus is the Messiah. And he, now he's coming and he's sharing the things that he's learned. And Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers, or grapevine produce figs? Neither can. Salt water spring yield, salt water spring yield fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? He should show his works by good conduct with wisdom's gentleness. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, there's Jonah again, the spirit of Jonah, I'm gonna call it. If you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't brag and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, or sensual and it's demonic. Man! So if we have this in our hearts, and the selfish ambition in our hearts are bitter and are envying, it's, it's on the line of being in tune with the demonic realm. Goodness gracious! We should have hearts that want to bend and yield to, oh, gosh, do I have this? In every situation, God, is my heart this way? Am I being this way right now, Lord? Because if so, I don't want to be in, line, in tune with the demonic realm at all. I don't. I want to be on in, with the Lord. I want to get. I want to be in step with Him. For where envy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every kind of evil. So, if we have disorder in our homes, we have to ask ourselves this question: Where am I at here, Lord? If at work, where am I at here at, at work, Lord? Am I in there with the, the, the disorderly bunch? Or, and, and if so, what comes with that is every kind of evil? Or if, I, or if I, God, am I in the spirit? Help me, Lord. And he tells us, he helps us. This is a good filter in making decisions for your life, is reading this passage of James and, and filtering 
whatever your situation is through these passages of scripture help you make sure that you're in line with them but the wisdom from above is first pure then it's peace loving it's gentle it's compliant it's full of mercy and good fruits without favoritism and hypocrisy and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace so the question is, is like if I'm having an altercation with people with folks gosh Lord am Am I peace loving? Am I gentle? Am I compliant? Am I full of mercy and I'm full of good fruits at this particular time? Because help me to search my heart. And or if they're putting pressure on me to do something that I might not think is right, well, is it peace loving? If it's full of peace, is it pure? Is it gentle? Or that it's filled with coercion or manipulation? Then I know that my answer is going to be no to that particular situation. Remember, there was a car salesman really trying to put pressure on Julie and I to just, and, I, and we just came with him. This is all that we have to spend. It really was. This was all that we had to spend. We were embarrassed to go to, to, you know, to the car dealer because this is all that we had. And they looked in our account that showed that we had like the money to pay for more. But the reality is that was already given to certain things. So this is all that we got to pay. And so they send the, you know, the big dog to come to the table. I'm going to watch. I'm going to get this, get some money out of these folks. So he comes, and so he gets it down to one dollar. One dollar. He gets it almost down to what we could spend in only one dollar. He says, "I'm sure you guys can come up with an extra dollar." And I was just like, "You're putting so much pressure. You weren't willing to yield. You weren't actually willing to respect and honor what we brought." In other words, you're trying to say that we're lying to you, so to speak. I'm like, no. We got up and <laughs> our car was falling apart. Bumpers falling off and, oh man, tires bald and we needed a car bad. And, uh, and, but let's go. So we hiked it up. <laughs> and, uh, and he's watching out the window. And next thing you know, here he's, he grabs the contract and I'm watching him and he's chasing us out of the parking lot. I got the deal, I got the deal. No, you chose not to respect and honor what we, what we presented to you. And so we, it just shows that this is, you just wanted to, to cheat us. And so we're going to go somewhere else. And then the other place just laid down and man, it flowed. And I think we got it for, for even less than what we could afford. So it worked out for our benefit. So we're just looking for what God wants. Anyway, that was a side note. But the bottom line is, is checking our hearts for if there's envy and selfish ambition and disorder because we don't want to be walking in evil. And, and ultimately, you know, it's hard to say that a prophet of God, like Jonah, is walking in evil. But the reality is this. He wanted them to be annihilated. He's walking in evil because he's not, that wasn't the heart of God. And we, as people of God, can be just like Jonah. We can be just like Jonah. Our hearts can be that hard that we don't even realize that God has been merciful and gracious to us and we have been unmerciful and gracious to other people and we should have the heart of God. If anyone else has the heart of God, we should have the heart of God. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Chapter four. Don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. You do not have because you ask not. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever eats, whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. Or do you think it's without reason the scripture says that the spirit who lives in us yearns jealously? But God gives greater grace. Therefore, he says this, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's the people of God. It should be the people of God. For this reason, submit to God and resist the devil. This is what Jonah should be doing, is resist the devil with his, his bigotry, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, double-minded people. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Your laughter must change to mourning and your joy to sorrow. 
Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Don't criticize one another, brothers. He who criticizes a brother or judges his brother criticizes the law and judges law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the, of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? James is throwing it down. So let's see how I got a few more minutes here. I want to give you a couple of contrasts. So I wanted us to know God, know him personally and intimately and walk in God's grace and mercy. And then I wanted us to also to catch the and ask ourselves the question if we have the heart of anger and or heart of the flesh or if we or if we start to cultivate the heart of God. I'm hoping that this is beginning is like, like God, do I have your heart? I know I received you. But what is on view before the world? Is, is your heart being shown? Or is it just my heart being shown? Because we don't, you know, if I meet someone, I don't want them to meet James Pope. I don't. Because apart from Christ, James Pope is a horrible person. But if you meet the newness of Christ in me, now that's something. You've met something amazing. But I don't want you to meet James Pope. And there'll be flashes and images where, ooh, that's, that's James Pope. Ooh. But I hope you give me the grace and mercy that has afforded to us as being created in formed and fashioned in the image of God because the church has a mandate that every human being has been created in the image of God and we have failed to recognize that so when we're walking in the midst of the world and we're seeing somebody torn up from the floor up and we just can walk in disdain and just disgust the disdain and disgust should be upon us because for some reason they had forgotten or never were told that they have been created in the image of God and God is inviting them to now understand and realize who they are and then to walk in the power and majesty of who they are because Christ has the propensity, the ability and capacity to dwell in him or her. They just might, not, they just might be ignorant of that fact. And so that's why he sends you and I out. And hopefully the flame is burning bright because if the flame is burning bright, just like that flame can start off a forest fire, the flame of the Spirit can set a forest fire of love and mercy. Here, let me touch that. Boom. And it brings them into life. And, then it's, and they're going to reach people that we never could reach. We had a... We had went to the actually a month or two ago, we went to the riverbed that goes alongside the trolley tracks. And we met a gentleman there, and uh, he was rough and rugged. And uh, he came here. He wasn't ready to come to church, though. He, he wanted to try to impress the women by coming with no shirt. And, uh, and then he tried to uh, say, hey, I got no clothes. And he's just like, no, man, you don't realize it, but I already knew that a brother of ours had gone down there and purchased a whole outfit for you so that you could come to church. So I already see what your motives and hope motives are. And uh, so, but this dear brother has still found it fit to go where he stays, even though he doesn't necessarily want Christ. He just wanted all the free things that come when we just come and we come with our tracks and we come with the little food and little thing. He just wanted those free things, but he didn't want really the love, mercy, and grace of God just yet. But our brother still kept coming to minister to him and in the process found that there was a number of other people underneath this bridge that are hungry for the Lord and that want the word of God to come. And so and as a result, because of that one little relationship, now we have the opportunity to set folks free. And one of the women that have been used and abused down there that would use drugs because someone had to, bring it, uh, to offer it and she just gets tired of saying no and then runs the risk of getting beat down and raped, this would go ahead and just 
consent. Well, as a result of him going down there week after week, she got herself into a program. She just didn't know how. She just needed the help. That's what we're supposed to do. That's who we're supposed to be. It's not just coming here. This is great that we can receive encouragement from each other, and boy, we need it because we get beat up out there. But we get char We should be getting charged from each other's love and mercy and grace and the gifts that God has put into each and every one of us. We should be getting charged up so that we can go out there and do it again and again and again because it's needed. You needed it. So do they. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5. This is a <clears throat> contrast of Christ and Jonah. If there is a point number two, you and I are to be clothed in Christ's humility. When Jesus is teaching from the chapter five to chapter, some parts of chapter seven, it's this, this, the well-known Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, these are the, atti the attitudes that we ought to be. Uh, people were blown away because it wasn't churchy. This is not churchy. This is not churchy. This is not churchy words right here. Was it? Wasn't any of that. Because people were trying to figure. I can't reach that. I can't reach that. That's for the. That's for the rich. That's for the elite. That's for the highly super religious. I don't understand that. That's for the educated. I can't, I can't reach God that way. Can you bring it down? So Christ comes to bring it down and he's on the mountain. He had received his disciples. This, this was all new. He received his disciples. He's walking and his people are seeing that this guy is coming and he's healing people. He's speaking this truth that is just unbelievable. And, and people are just like, I got to see what's going on. And it's, in the region of Galilee, there's not a whole lot happening. It's just this, the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee is out there. And then there's these villages just far and far apart from each other. Fishing village, you know, not, nothing happening out there and it's dry and it's hot. But yet the greatest show that could ever, ever enter this realm enters in in humility. And they're going, they're checking him out. This guy has the ability to feed people with two loaves of fit, you know, two loaves of bread and five fish. Let's go see what's going on. What he's gonna do next. He sees the crowd, chapter five, verse one. He sees the crowd, he goes up on the mountain. After he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them. Another scripture says, and then he opened his mouth. He put some serious tent. Then this God opens his mouth. This God that had become incarnate in the flesh opens his mouth as if they're just waiting. What is he going to say? And he says, the poor in spirit are blessed. Those that are broken and bankrupt in the spirit, they're the blessed ones. For ultimately, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Well, what about all those that are just super highfalutin religious folks? It's open to them too, but they better catch it the way that Jesus means for it to be caught because it's not coming from those that are in the realm of Jonah at this particular instance. Jonah is being a religious fruitcake. Jonah is representing, if, if when we fast forward to the New Testament, he is just like the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's what Jonah is representing. And that is one of the things we have to ask ourselves this question. God, am I honoring you with my, just my lips? Or is my very life honoring you? Because if it's just my lips, then my heart is far from you. Matter of fact, I probably don't have your heart. Give me your heart, God. Let's not leave it there. Give me. Give, I, if you, I don't have your heart, I'm going to die. 
that should be the place where we should be. Those who mourn are blessed. Those who are mourning for their sin, mourning over their sin, they're just, ah, I sin, oh, yeah, it's a big deal. No, no. no God, I, God, I know it hurts your heart. It hurts mine too. I'm just like Paul. I, I, I don't do the things that I ought to do. I do the things that I don't want to do. Or is it yours? I do the things that I don't want to do, but I actually want to do them. Is that what? No. Hopefully your heart is broken. Just like Paul's. I don't do the things that I know I ought to do. I want to do the things that you want me to do, God, but I just don't seem to be able to find the way or the means to do it. But Paul comes out of it. And he goes, ah, I know it's because of Jesus Christ. And with that, for they will be comforted. You're comforted by the word of God. You're comforted by Christ. You're comforted by what he's actually done on the cross for you. The gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. It's not, you know, in this world, it just seems like the ungentle seem to get everything. You know, the prideful, the arrogant, the, you know, I'm just going to go grab, I'm just going to just grab the whole world and just bring it to me. And they're not gentle. They're willing to step on and squash people and commit character assassinations in order to get it. And they seem to like prosper. Read, Gen uh, read Psalm 73 and find out what happens to people like that. And so God, and Jesus comes and says, the gentle are really the, the ones that are blessed for they will inherit everything. The merciful are blessed for they will be shown mercy. The pure in heart are blessed, for they will see God. I, I think you get my point. And again, we're going to back to anger. You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment, and whoever says to his brother, fool, name-calling, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you moron, will be subject to hellfire. So if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on, your, on the way with him or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you will be thrown into prison. I assure you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Wow. When he's preaching this Sermon on the Mount, or, or talking to his disciples that are around him, he's really talking about having this heart of repentance, having this heart of meekness, having this heart of gentleness. And it's completely opposite of what the world preaches. So when he was done preaching, they just like, they couldn't believe that, wow. This was not just some religious exercise, but actually this was the living word because their hearts began to burn in them. That, wow, this was, this, this, I never heard anything like this. This is truth, but this is something that I can grab, I can sink my teeth into. So the question, let me make sure I'm, yeah, I got maybe five minutes. The question here today is, do you have a heart for God? The next question, if so, does your life reflect it? If we have a heart of the Lord, a personal relationship, we will reflect the Lord. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This would be a truth too, that I have been crucified with Christ, yet it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself for me. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passing away. Behold, all things are becoming new. This, this old nature of being just crotchety like Jonah is being made new. Jonah has an opportunity to be uncrotchety and to be new. And God gives him that opportunity at the end by asking him those questions. Is it right for you to be angry? Shouldn't I be able to be merciful and gracious to 120,000 people who can't discern from the right hand or the left hand? 
this is the left, this is the right. <laughs> Can't discern. Thank you, Lord. I need that mercy because I have a hard time discerning which one is left and which one is right. If it wasn't for your power and my majesty, I would have my shoes on backwards. And I'd probably walk in circles. My last thing, because I think it's pretty important. I'm going to go to John chapter 15. Jesus says that he is the true vine and my father is the vine vineyard keeper. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. He's pruning Jonah, but I hope Jonah gets it. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me. And I and you, just as the branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, so neither can, can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. If Jonah stays there, Jonah will wither because he is on the side he's not remaining in the Lord they gather them together they gather them throw them into the fire and they are burned but if you remain in me and my words remain in you ask whatever you want and it will be done for you because you are walking in agreement with him my father is glorified by this that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples as the father has loved me I have also loved you remain in my love if you keep my commands, and we saw Jonah time and time again falling out. Remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have spoken these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you slaves anymore because a slave does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you that you should go out and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give you. This is what I command you. Love one another. Jonah, the Jewish prophet of anger, hatred, disobedience, short-lived repentance, lacking God's heart, unlike the gentleness of his name, which is dove, was prideful, selfish, self-righteous, and shows the heart of humankind in this world's kingdom. You have the opportunity to continue to, sh to, to project the heart of Jonah or you have the opportunity to exhibit the heart of the renewed human being, which is found in Jesus. You have the opportunity to project radical generosity. You have the power and privilege to project servant leadership. You have the power to project radical extreme peacemaking. You have the power to project radical forgiveness. You have the power to project deep piety that re rejects religious hypocrisy. You have the power and the privilege to reflect by coming not to condemn the world, but to save the world through Christ because Christ died for both Jew and Gentile. Now the question I have is, will you and I reflect Jonah or Christ? Will you pray with me and then Leo will come and bring our communion. So Father, we just thank you for your mercy and grace. I, just pray, Lord, that we here in this place, in this building, really with one foot in this world and one foot in the kingdom right now, Lord, that we've heard your word and that we have an opportunity to respond. 
that, Lord, forgive us, God, when we reflect more of Jonah than we reflect of you. We recognize the human side of us, that it has the propensity to sin. We, it has the propensity to do everything contrary to what your word says. But Lord, we thank you for supplying to us your son, your servant, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who makes it possible that we can have a relationship with you that died on the cross for our sin. But I pray that your power through your Holy Spirit would come and convict sin in us because sometimes, Lord, we're reflecting we're just confessing right before you. Some of us are in this room, and I pray that, Lord, if there's some that have, have been reflecting this, but yet don't recognize it in their own lives right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move and move them and enable them and empower them to see, Lord, the errors of their way so that they too can also repent. Because it's that important that life and death, heaven and hell, right here, the choice that you leave for us, that we would have the heart of Jesus rather than the heart of the world, rather than the heart of Jonah. Help us, almighty God. We ask for forgiveness of these things. We ask that you would move us in the power and might and majesty of the Holy Ghost to do as you command, to love one another. Even though we don't understand sometimes the situations that we're in, help us to still yet love so that they will know that we're your disciples. Thank you, Father, for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. And I apologize that I forgot to.